in our chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I entitled my sermon this morning, Solo Does Not Work. Solo Does Not Work. And I think this is something very prevalent in this country at this time. I mean, let's face it, this country is a very was founded on individualism in a sense. And unfortunately, I think the individualism of the United States of America has trickled down to affect the church in some sense. Especially, you may not like to hear this, hear this in rural areas. Well, let's be honest with ourselves. We like it when people stay out of our business. We like it when we are left alone, where we can pursue a life of peace without the involvement of somebody else making decisions for <coughs> us. A.K.A. telling us what to do. And it is rugged individualism was how this country was founded. We had explorers that trekked and explored uncharted places. Those that settled into areas first, when this country was settled, they grew their own food. They made their own clothes. They made their own soap. They made their own tools. It's not a lot of times. They developed new implements. You do know that John Deere got his start by developing a plow. You know what he developed the plow for? The clay of the Midwest. Because their plows that they brought and traveled with could not handle the clay of the Midwest. They couldn't shear off the clay when it was plowed. That's how John Deere got his start. He developed something. Even though this is changing in our country to an extent, I still think we celebrate the individualism that this country was founded on. But I think it'd be taken too far. Mankind was not created to be a bunch of individuals trying to figure out what to do and how to get by. Individualism is appealing to us because man is inclined not only to do his own thing, but to do it alone. That's what John MacArthur says, and it is. And I think this philosophy sometimes can get into the church. The philosophy that man is, for the most part, self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. That philosophy does not come from God. It comes from Satan himself. If it doesn't come from God, it's coming from Satan. The exact opposite is what God's plan is. And we as Christians can fall into this individualism. This trap that we can make it on our own. I don't need that person. I'll be okay. It just causes too much stress and worry in my life. I don't need others. That's not true. That's not true. Yes, it's true that God saves individually. God saves individually. But he does not save us to be individuals. God saves individually, but he does not save us to be individuals. He puts us into a body when he saves us. To function with others that he has brought with it to the same body. A.K.A. the local church. A local body of believers. Which, I will not deny, which will always do this, it will create difficult circumstances. Because we are a bunch of fallen sinners. Redeemed, but yet still fallen, brought together to try to function as one body. There are going to be disagreements. But there still can be unity. Unity does not mean everybody thinks the same thing about something, by the way. It's not the thought process within a church that says this. The church can only be unified when everybody thinks the same thing on a certain issue. Therefore, if the church is not thinking the same thing, they are not unified. No. No. We do not always have to think the same thing. Yes, there are certain core doctrines. There are cer certain core doctrines of the faith we must be unified on. You have to agree. Tim had to agree with certain core doctrines last night at his interview meeting. And he says, yes, I agree with this. I believe that God is triune. He is one essence, three persons. I believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, infallible, 
all has all authority for one's life and is sufficient for one's life. I believe that salvation is by faith alone and Christ's work alone. But only our trust in what he has done saves us. What he has accomplished saves us. And his substitutionary atonement that was that prayer hymn we just sang. Have you been to the cross? Do you believe that you were there? Did he take your sin? Did he bear your sin? Was he your substitute 2,000 years ago? Did he take your place? We have to draw the line on those things. That's not what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But we have to draw the line. Why? Because it's the gospel. It's the gospel. What's at stake in the gospel? Heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. When I prayed this morning for people, I have good friends that are in the Catholic Church. And hell is on the line for them. They truly believe it's their faith in Christ and their good works that are going to get them to heaven. They truly believe that, which means what? They don't understand who Christ is. They do not fully understand what he did for them. That's a different Jesus. That's a different gospel. Paul did this to Peter in Galatians. Peter was getting caught up when the Judaizers came into the area where he was, which the letter of Galatians is written about. Which is probably the first letter of the New Testament, by the way. Paul publicly rebuked Peter. Publicly rebuked him. And said, you're getting caught up with these Judaizers that are saying, you need Christ and you need to be circumcised and have good works under the law. He rebuked him. But let's not forget, their relationship did not end there. When Peter wrote his last letter, 2 Peter, he said this about Paul. He called Paul his beloved brother. They figured it out. They still had unity. I'm sure it wasn't pleasant at the time for either one of them. It's not pleasant for me to have to go to somebody and point something out. But it's necessary sometimes for truth. It's the best thing for somebody. And that's what Paul did for Peter. And not only that, Paul did it for the gospel. Not only is heaven and hell at stake, it's God's gospel. We have no right to change it. And think we know a better way. Because that's what truly changes people. The truth. When God takes the truth spoken, even though it may hurt at the time it is spoken, He does the heart surgery. He's not looking for behavior modification. He's looking for heart transformation. And that's what Paul is doing here in the letter to Corinthians. That is what he is challenging them. He wants to see heart transformation. And in chapter 12, he does that with two groups. Two groups. When in regards to spiritual gifting, we looked at the first group two weeks ago. The one group that said, I am not needed. I have nothing to offer. We saw that that's not true. It's a lie. If you've been brought into the body of Christ, you have something to offer within a local congregation. If you deny that, not only is it not true, you're denying that the body is made up of many. You're denying what a body is in itself. It's a manyness that makes one. And also those that say, well, I'm not needed, truly are saying this. They may not be thinking this, but this is what you're saying. God, you got it wrong. We looked again, we looked at this two weeks ago. We, God, you got it wrong. I want that gift. I wish I could teach Sunday school. I wish I could do this or that. What did you gift me with? I want something more. But there's another group in Corinth. The group that we're going to look at today. <coughs> that is saying this. Look what I got. Look what I got. I don't need that. Look at my miraculous gift. I can speak in 20 languages. I can heal people. I have to get the miracles. I don't need brothers and sisters. I can do this ministry thing all by myself. All by myself. This is the attitude that he's dealing with from verses 21 and on in chapter 12. 
Listen how Calvin sums up this whole chapter before we look in depth. He says, the sum of what he states amounts to this, that gifts are not distributed thus variously among believers in order that they may use, be used apart, but that in the division there is a unity. Inasmuch as one spirit is the source of all these gifts, God is the Lord of all the administrations and the author of all exercises of power. Now God, who is the beginning, who gives the gifts, he's saying, ought to also be the end. Again, what are the gifts used for? Fill up the body of Christ so that he will get more glory. And he gets more glory when we do what we're supposed to do. And he gets more glory when there's unity within the body. Do you know when there's not unity within the body, and I'm not saying we have to agree on anything, the Holy Spirit is grieved. Ephesians. The Holy Spirit is grieved. Why? Because what does God know? He knows a triune love that has never known disunity. And we are going to be, when we are glorified, we are going to, we were talking about this last night after the service. When we are glorified, we are going to be brought into that triune love. And we will know, no, no more ununifiedness. But look how many times Paul talks about this. I hope you still have your Bibles open. We're going to look at some paragraph breaks. So my, the a, the NS, NAS, the New American Standard, has a little different paragraph breaks than yours may have. But I'm going to show you some verses, what Paul is pointing out. And every time he starts a new thought, if you will. Start in verse 4 of chapter 12. What does he say? Now there are various gifts, but the same Spirit. One Spirit. And I have a paragraph break at verse 12. For even as the body is one. My next paragraph break is verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. The next paragraph break in the NAS is chapter, verse 27. Some of you may have others, but 27. Now you are Christ's body. Singular. Now you are Christ's body. And that is just pregnant right there. And individual members of it. You think Paul is pointing something out in this chapter? He kind of hinges the beginning of the chapter and the second half of the chapter on verse 20. This is kind of the hinge of the whole chapter. Check out verse 20. But now there are many members, but one body. Paul just keeps repeating this over and over in this chapter. Why? Because he's stressing something, obviously. And we've talked about it a lot. We're going to talk about it again today. But Calvin says this about verse 20. And I think he nails it. He said, he repeats this often. Because the stress of the whole question lies here. That the unity of the body is, is of such a nature as cannot, cannot be maintained but by diversity of members. Unity cannot be maintained but by diversity. That just doesn't sound right, does it? Unity cannot be maintained but by diversity of members. And that while the members differ from each other in the offices and functions... It is in such a way as to have mutual connection with each other for the preservation, for the preservation of the body. It's our diversity that actually preserves the body. When the elder board disagrees on something, it actually is preserving the body because we have to work through it unified. It is a good thing. Unity is not agreeing exactly the same with everybody. This is not what unity is. Which we will get to. So let's look at the gifted ones, as I mentioned earlier. Let's look at the gifted ones that needed to grow in their knowledge of what true unity looked like in the body of Christ. And Paul starts combating their thinking in verse 21. Starts combating their thinking in verse 21. 
He said, can an eye, he says, an eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need for you. He says, on the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker, those that seem to be weaker, remember he's talking to the gifted ones, ones that thought they had it all figured out. He said, on the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Verse 23, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundantly. <coughs> And our less presentable members become more presentable. Whereas, our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, and this is big. God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member which lacked. Which lacked what? Which lacked prominence. Which lacked prominence. What is Paul doing? He's telling the exact opposite to the Corinthians of what they're thinking is to be true. You think you don't need others? You have the important spiritual gifts? You think you're more important than the person that just has a gift that you don't even see the manifestation of in a miraculous way? Well, their gift is indispensable. Their gift is indispensable, not yours. We could probably survive without yours, but I don't know if we could survive without theirs. Some of you may remember Desert Storm. It was probably the most publicized war, at least I remember it, because it was, I was, I would have been probably about a 10th grader in high school. It was a response of what? The coalition forces to Iraq when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. It only lasted 43 days. January 7th to February 28th, 1991. They're probably like, why am I talking about Desert Storm? There's a reason. The shortness of the war was due, humanly speaking, to probably one thing. <coughs> the superiority, the superior air power of the coalition forces. The coalition forces flew over 100,000 sorties in that war. And if you were old enough, you probably remember watching the news, there goes another jet taking off, there goes another jet. And I'm not talking about this because of war, I'm talking, there goes another jet, there goes another jet. What did we see? We saw F-117 stealth bombers, and I'm an airplane guy, some of you are not, I'm sorry, but we saw F-4 wild weasels, we saw F-18 hornets, F-14 Tomcats taking off from aircraft carriers, F-15 eagles, F-16, A-10 warthogs, I mean, this is stuff attracts us. We have air shows for this. The United States Air Force recruits how? With a demonstration team called the Thunderbirds flying what? F-16s. How does the United States Navy recruit? With a demonstration team called the Blue Angels flying F-18s. Most of you have probably seen these teams in action at the air show. Fighter jets are the main attraction to air shows. Fighter jets were the main attraction to the news during Desert Storm. But do you know what the most important planes were in the war? KC-135 and a KC-10. Anybody know what they are? Refueling planes. Refueling. The jets didn't fly if they weren't scheduled for refueling. Does anybody know what a KC-135 looks like? If you put windows in it and paint it white, you're probably sitting in it as a passenger. Same thing with a KC-10. Anybody see them during that war? Talk about them? The fighter wings used to fight, almost literally fight, to get refueler schedules so they could be a part of the action. If they couldn't get refuelers, they did not fly. So what was the most important plan in the war? It's the same thing with the body of Christ. The most essential parts of the bodies are the ones that go unnoticed. And God has done this in his sovereignty. They're the indispensable parts. Just think of the human body. You can survive without a leg or two, right? You could. I'm not saying it'd be easy. You could survive without both your legs and both your arms. But how long are you going to last without your liver? 
or your heart? What are the nose parts of the body, the hands, the eyes? Do we see the heart? Do we see the liver? This is what's going on in Corinth. Again, the out and front gifts, the prophecy, the languages, the healing. These people that had them said, we've got the gifts. We don't need anybody else. But in truth, God has designed the body that the most indispensable parts of the church at Corinth and now are the ones we don't even see. God has put it together so they get the greater honor. The less, what we think are the less honorable, honorable ones are the ones that get the greater honor. So there will be no divisions. God has not stopped building his body this way. He has done it throughout church history and he still does it today. Charles Spurgeon, many of you know that name, was probably one of the greatest preachers of the gospel ever, at least that we know of. God gave him a public platform. At one time, he preached to over 25,000 people without a sound system. When they built his tabernacle that housed 6,000 people, I mean, it was built because people just kept coming in from out of town. He who used to have to tell his members, please stay away tomorrow. I'm expecting a lot of unconverted <coughs> people to be there. I want them to hear the gospel. His sermons are around today. I have his complete set. Other writings are still widely published by him. He's one of my favorites to read. It just refreshes my soul when I read him. But you know what fueled his preaching? And he said this. Do you know what fueled his preaching? When he was preaching at the tabernacle in London, his deacons were in the basin on their faces before God while he was preaching. Where's the most important parts? There are people praying right now for this service that you don't even see. That are scheduled to pray right now during this service that you don't even see. That's what's feeling this. Virgin always said the most important part of his preaching were the ones that prayed while he was preaching. Martin Luther, probably the best known reformer, maybe Calvin, but most people will say Luther. He was a bull in a china shop. I'm poor, probably more wired like Martin Luther. When he understood that salvation was by faith alone, through Christ alone, he stood up for that truth, boldly, sometimes a little over the top. He confronted, he wanted to see reform. By the way, the reformers wanted to see reform within the Catholic Church. They wanted it to go back to the scriptures. They did not want to break off. When they see all the Catholic Church would not recant and repent of not believing the gospel, that's when they broke off. And that's when we became Protestants, protesters. That's why we are called Protestants. We are protesting. <coughs> They wanted to see reform. And he was a bull in the china shop. He spoke for truth. You can trace Luther's writings to this day. His <coughs> writings give us roots. Give this country roots. Luther's writings affected people that led to the founding of this country. But Luther could not have done it if it wasn't for a man named Philip Melanchthon. Anybody ever heard of him? <coughs> Probably not, unless you're a student of church history. He was a quiet, gentle, loving man. He was the one that would keep Luther in check. He was a peacemaker. He would calm Luther down. He would bring them back. They said their friendship, Luther and Philip's friendship, was comparable to David and Jonathan of the scriptures. But even most more importantly than that, you know what fueled the Reformation? The church going back to the scriptures was prayer. It was prayer. We won't even know this side of heaven how it was fueled by prayer. That's what the indispensable parts do. 
So how do we view everybody here? How do we view everybody here? How do we view the less noticeable parts? Are we unified? Do we think that certain giftings are better than others? I think maybe the more important question this morning is this. What does it mean to be truly unified? Paul tells us what it means to be truly unified. It's not agreeing on everything. And I think we just saw this very recently. And I bring this up to show the beauty of unification. We voted in our annual business meeting to take on a new missionary, Augie. And those of it you were there know it was a split vote. He passed by one vote. Does that mean we're not unified? No. Not at all. That's not unity. But it passed by one vote. Through that, people wanted more information. And Paul came in to give us more information on what Augie is doing, what he is proclaiming. And there was more discussion. And some people were thinking, are we becoming divided? I'm like, no. 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 How do I know that? I know that because of verses 25 and 26. Let me read those verses before I continue on with this illustration. Look at verse 25 again. He says, So that there be no division in the body, all people need to agree with each other. No. So that there be no division within the body, here's the answer to how to get rid of division. But that the members may have the same care for one another. And then he starts to illustrate that in verse 26. <laughs> when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. When one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Remember what's going on in Corinth. Those with the greater gifts didn't care what was going on with those with lesser gifts, did they? But you know what I saw? Or heard or had to talk about with people the Sunday after Paul was here and their questions did not get answered about what Augie was proclaiming. And by the way, I'm thankful that this church is at the point that they want to know what our missionaries are proclaiming about Jesus Christ. I think that is a really good sign of a healthy church. What are they teaching? Really good sign. And some of the people found out after the meeting. You know what the number one Christian denomination in Mongolia is? The Mormons. And they're being persecuted just like God. And they do not proclaim Christ as triune within the oneness of God. There's many other things, but they believe Christ is a special creation. So people wanted to know. What did they want to know? They wanted to know, what is Augie actually teaching? Again, which is a good thing. But this is how people contacted me when that wasn't answered the way they thought it should be. And it has been answered since then, by the way. He's proclaiming a biblical Jesus. I got statements like this. They're like, I don't know how to proceed. My questions were not answered. But I want to be careful. I want to be careful not to hurt anyone that may perceive my questions as an attack on them. I'm not sure if I want to support Augie as what this, some people would tell me. I need more answers to my questions. But I do not want to hurt anybody that is ready to support him right now. Did they disagree on things? Yes. But what did you hear? What did I hear? I care and love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to be careful how I proceed with something I disagree on because of my love for them. That's what Paul is saying. You want unity when you disagree? Do you care? Do you care when somebody else is hurting that you may have a disagreement on with at this time? Do you truly care if they are hurting? And they may be hurting because of the disagreement you have with them. You may be the cause of their pain.
Do you have a prayer and a concern for others? Are you happy and elated when somebody you may disagree on with a certain thing? We're not talking to non-negotiables. Is elevated and honored because of something that they did. Like, I don't really like that person, but they're my brother and sister in Christ, and I am happy for them. Genuinely happy for them. You don't have to like somebody to love them. If that were true, no marriage would ever last. I'm pretty confident April did not like Aaron at some point during the 13 years. I'm pretty confident Jen probably didn't like me more than I didn't like her during our 25 plus years. That's not what it means. What does it mean to care for somebody? Think of it this way. If you had cancer and you had a physician, would you want a physician that just did his job? Or would you want a physician that you felt actually cared for what you were going through? You can do it either way. I can do my job. Here's what we're going to do. See you later. Or you want the physician that says, all right, have I tried everything? Have I looked into everything? Have I done this? That actually cares for them. I can remember my nurses when I was sick. You could tell the ones that cared, and you could tell the ones that were this there to get the paycheck. Did they still do what they needed to do? Yes. You guys okay? All right, one? No. No? Okay. Guys. Father, I just uh, lift up Wanda to you at this time, and I thank you for those that care for her. I pray that you would just comfort her. I pray that you will be in control of this situation, as I know that you are. Lord, we just uh, lift up this situation that you will give peace to all those involved. And I pray that you will give wisdom to those that are caring for her. And I just thank you for her as a sister in Christ here within this body. I just give you the praise and the glory. Right there. Do you care what she's going through? And some of you, but I don't even know her like some others. And I can tell you one, and I don't agree on everything. But do we care? You want the doctor that cares. You want the nurses that care. Caring is ha having disdain for another person. It's not having rival. It's not saying, I must have it my way or no other way. It's not envy or malice. It's not, I'll care, but I'll be over here until they figure it out. That's what's going on in Corinth. I'm going to be over here until you guys get these gifts. When you figure it out, you can come over to our group. It's not my way or the highway. Do you consider yourself better than another person? You can process through maybe you're wrong if you disagree with somebody. Or that, no, I'm standing here. I'm right. They need to figure it out. How do I know Paul's doing this? Because where's he going? He's going to chapter 13. And what is chapter 13 all about? Well, let's just read verses 4 to 6. This is what Paul's building to from verse 25 and on. He's building the chapter 13. That's what he says in verse 31. I'll show you a better way. We've all heard these verses. 13, 4 through 6. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. So how can we care? How can we truly care? You got to know where you came from, first and foremost, and that's verse 27. Now you are Christ's body. Now you are Christ's body. What does it mean to be a part of Christ's body? 
you know what it means to be a Christ, part of Christ's body? This is the only thing that can produce love for people that you disagree with. Do you understand your greatest need? Your need for forgiveness. If you do not truly understand your need for forgiveness, you will not be able to understand what it means to forgive. But now, now you're a part of Christ's body. There was a pastor in the Dayton area that was in ministry for 20 years. When God got a hold of him and he was truly repentant after 20 years, this is what came out. He had been committing adultery against his wife for those 20 years in ministry. 20 years. You know where that lady is today? Married to that man. How? How? But she saw genuine signs of repentance in her husband. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you sat down and talked to this woman, she would understand her sinfulness in need of a Savior. She understands <coughs> verse 27. Now you are Christ's body. How did you get there? I'm not saying it was easy for her. I'm sure it was not easy and she's probably still going through stuff and it may have been three steps forward three steps backwards at times but do you see it the only possible way to be unified and caring for others if we truly understand what we need what we need for forgiveness from him this is what jesus prayed for the church in john 17 he said father let them be one as you and i are one so that the world will see it was he saying we would agree on everything there? No. He knew we would disagree. But he wanted us to be unified. So others would see it. And that's, it's not possible for us to agree on everything this side of heaven. It's not. I'm not trying to say that negatively. I think we continue to grow in truth and knowledge and we become closer. But it's not going to be possible. We live in a fallen, sinful world. You will disagree with somebody within this congregation at some point. And it will probably make you upset. But you can still love them. You can still care for them. How do I know that? The way he ends this chapter. Very interestingly, by the way. Very interestingly. Again, in verse 28, he tells us what? God has appointed in the church... Who appointed these people? God did. He says the same thing in verses 4 through 6. The Spirit gave the spirits by His sovereign choice. Verse 11, He says the same thing. He's the one that wills the distribution of spiritual gifts. Verse 18, He says the same thing. End of chapter, or verse 24, He says the same thing. What is He saying? God has composed the body by His sovereign will. He's placed the church together by His sovereign will. Again, Corinthians are dealing with, you need this gift, you don't need that gift. That's why he, Paul points this out. God has put together as he wills. But check out what Paul does here. Verse 28 through 31. We'll just do 28 and 29. God has appointed in the church, first, apostles. And he's just given a list. It's not an exhaustive. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then, miracles. Then, gifts of healing. Helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. You're like, all right. We got apostles, which laid the foundation of the church and the prophets. No longer needed. Those offices are closed because we have the finished word. The foundation is the Bible. Then we got other miraculous gifts. But then Paul goes to his questions to try to get people think to think in verse 29. He asks these questions. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? Do all interpret? Do they? What's missing? From verse 28, he leaves two things out. And it's not by accident. What did he leave out in verses 29 and 30? 
He left out the gifts of helps and administration. What is he trying to drive home to the Corinthians? What's the important gifts? Helps and administration. He doesn't mention them in 2930. He leaves them out. And that's not an accident. This is divinely inspired. Helps and administration were probably the most least prized gifts at the church of Corinth. I believe that's why Paul left them out. And those are the, probably the most needed gifts at the church of Corinth. What is he trying to tell the Corinthians? What's he been trying to tell the Corinthians for the whole chapter? God is sovereign in his gifting. God is the one that sovereignly places the gifts within the church. I've given you helps and administration. You don't even realize you need them. And they are the ones holding you together. So you may be thinking, okay, if that's true, what about verse 31? What about verse 31? Let's look at verse 31. Because what's it say? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. But earnestly desire the greater gifts. Are we not supposed to desire greater gifts? First, I would ask, what are the greater gifts? You think about this. What are the greater gifts, according to Paul? I'm just saying. And listen here. Listen to this. This, by one commentator, one theologian. And think about this whole chapter we've been looking at. Paul is saying, God has sovereignly given gifts. God has sovereignly given gifts to make the church function as it should. He's the chooser of that. There is a really good chance that you can decide for yourselves. Verse 31 should be translated like this. And this is big. You decide for yourselves. But you desire the greater gifts. That changes it, doesn't it? But earnestly desire the greater gifts to, but you earnestly desire greater gifts. I think Paul is saying, you're sitting there worried about the bigger and greater gifts. God's given you everything you already need. It's been done. Just do what you're supposed to do. Does that not flow better with the whole chapter? And then he goes, what does he say after that? Oh yeah, well, Forget about that. Let me just show you the best way, period. Love. Love each other. This is what MacArthur says about the rendering of, but you, but you earnestly desire greater gifts. I think Paul's question, like, what are you thinking? You don't need greater gifts. You just need to function with how he's sovereignly giving them to you. MacArthur says this. This rendering, as in, but you earnestly desire the greater gifts, seems much more appropriate to the context, both of what proceeds and of what follows. It is consistent with the tone of the letter and the sin of the Corinthians, because they clearly prized the show of your gifts, that seemingly greater gifts. It would be foolish of Paul to command them to do what they were already eagerly doing. Do you hear that? Why would Paul, who just rebuked them for saying to show your gifts are wrong, say desire the greater gifts? It makes no sense, does it? The Corinthians were to stop seeking gifts because to do so is presumptuous and purposeless. Every believer is already perfectly gifted in the way God has planned, which best suits their ministry. Read the chapter again. It's all over it. God has sovereignly given gifts. You think you know better than he does. That's what Paul's been saying, right? Why would he say desire the bigger gifts at the end? One little word. And some of your note, Bibles have notes with this in it. But then where does he go? He says that again, MacArthur says, Every believer is already perfectly gifted in the way God planned, which best suits their ministry. What they needed to seek was a more excellent way, verse 31. The way of contentment and harmony, the way of love. 
And that's what he's about to show them in chapter 13. Do you see how it just flows better? And you decide for yourselves what you think is better. But how does unity happen? It happens when we swallow our pride. When we stop thinking our way is the best way. When we stop saying, I'm right, they're wrong. When we have a concern for another well-being above our own, even if they are wrong, and they need to grow a little. But I will end with this question. If you want to seek unity with your brothers and sisters. Before you go talk to somebody. Before you seek it out. Were you right or wrong when God saved you? Were you right or wrong when God saved you? Even if somebody is wrong against you. There can be unity. Even if you disagree with somebody, there can be unity. How? Love. Chapter 13. Father, again, I just praise you and I thank you for this message. I thank you for your truth of your word. I pray that we will ponder these things. Lord, as we come to celebrate the oneness of the body within the Lord's Supper, I praise and thank you for chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. You have sovereignly gifted everyone in this building that is in you so this body can grow and everyone is needed. Praise you for your glory. Amen.